All right, and welcome to Active Learning in Large Classes. I am your presenter. I'm Dr. Amanda Smothers. I'm the Teaching and Learning Coordinator in uh, NIU's Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning. And I'll be taking questions throughout and at the end of the presentation. So if you have any specific questions related to what we're covering during the presentation, feel free to post that to the chat and I can address those as they come up. I've got the chat open so I can see anything that you post there. Um, I've been in academia for 15 years now um, and I've been teaching for all 15 of those years, but I've also been a faculty developer for over three years now, or actually over four years now. Gosh, time flies and then COVID. Um, so let's uh, learn a little bit more about you all. Um, so in the text chat, just tell us, you know, what's your department of vision, your institution, Scott, um, explain what you hope to get out of the workshop. And I'll give you a second to do that. And as you're doing that, I'm also going to put up this next um, slide. This is something I'd like to do in my synchronous sessions. Um, and you can adapt to this also for in-person um, class sessions too. But I like to check in with my students or with my attendees. You know, how are you today? An easy way to do that is just share an emoji in the chat. That way I can kind of get a sense of where everybody's at. So if you want to share an emoji in the chat of how you're doing today, um, you can do that and I will share one as well. My emoji of the day is going to be coffee, as it usually is in the mornings. Um, okay, great. So we've got another institution represented, Abilene Christian, um, which is great. So you're looking for strategies for engaging larger classes, um, especially the freshman cornerstone class. Oh, so we've got some rain there. Um, and then we have counseling and higher education at IU, um, finding innovative ways to engage students. Great. Oh, and a nice big smile. Awesome. All right, so our workshop objectives for today um, are to explain the importance of active learning, to distinguish how lecture versus active learning exercises impact student learning, to identify some strategies and some tools to aid our active learning exercises in large classes, and to plan how to implement active learning exercises in a lesson plan. And we'll use an example for that one um, from a professor. Um, so we're, we're not gonna skip that, but um, so we've already introduced ourselves, but you know, and you kind of engaged a, a couple of these things, but like, what do you teach mainly um, do you have a best large class strategy that you want to share? Um, and what is your biggest challenge with large classes? So you can go ahead and share that in the chat as well. And I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that too.
All right, great. So thank you. So teaching counseling courses at the graduate level, um, classes tend to be small, but there is an upcoming large online class in the fall. So hoping to find some ways to ensure that work is engaging. Awesome. Great. And then teaching research, digital media, cornerstone, um, most are doc courses, which are smaller, typically um, freshman courses large. Um, okay, so the challenge that you've identified is variety and engagement. So we'll definitely talk about engagement um, today. Um, this is mostly geared towards, you know, in person, but you can adapt any of these to online teaching as well. Um, the first thing that we want to address is why active learning you know is important um so what ideas do you have why do you think that active learning is important and again you can you can post that to the chat you can also unmute yourself if you want and share aloud if you feel comfortable doing so yeah i'll just uh um, I'm assuming you can hear me, um, Amanda. Um, yeah, I, I feel like active learning is just, um, you know, it's kind of a, it's a learning staple. I mean, it's, you know, it's, um, and I, I don't think I have anything new to add to the equation other than, um, you know, building upon what we know about students' responses when they're a part of the process as opposed to uh, just full consumers. Great, thank you. By the way, I'm assuming you're friends and know Jason Rohde. I do know Jason Rohde. Yeah, I know, know him well. Tell him I said hey. I will. I will definitely let him know. <laughs> Yeah, so definitely active learning is important um, in, you know, engaging student in their learning, um, but also that assessment piece of, you know, our students actually learning. Um, so it helps us gauge that as well. Um, some of the constraints. Oh, no problem. Yazita. Um, Yanitsa. Sorry. Um, so some of the constraints of larger classes and you can always, you know, post things to the chat as they come up to or as you think of them um you know we've got this kind of sense of overload in in large classes there's a lot of students there's a lot of um, people to keep track of um, and and to facilitate the learning of um, we also get into some of the the passenger syndrome um, which is where you know some members or maybe most members of the class um, experience this passenger syndrome where they're just along for the ride. Um, they're abdicating the responsibility, you know, believing that someone else is in charge, either that you're just in charge and they just need to sit there and passively receive information um, or that it, their classmates are in charge and they're relying on their classmates um, to kind of drive the car um, of the conversation uh, and participate kind of for them and they can just recede into the background. Um, and then there's also a lot of stress involved with large classes. Um, so we'll talk about, um, you know, lecture next. So what are lectures good for? What are they not so good for? Um, lectures are good for presenting current information. So kind of giving an overview of some information. Um, it's also a way that we can fill the gap between current research and what's already been published. Um, also summarizing the material, especially if we're drawing on multiple sources for that material. Um, so summary lecture is not just an attempt to water down course content. Instead, our goal with a summary lecture should be to provide a lens through which students can understand the greater whole. Um, also focusing material on a particular area of interest. So a good lecture 
could indicate how course content fits here and now with the background and interests of this particular group of students. Um, we can also use lecture to relay key concepts or principles or ideas, um, and that doing that helps learners identify what matters and what might be less important. Um, those sorts of lectures can be short and just kind of review the key points to give some context to student discussions or an activity that's to follow. Um, and then another way that we can use lecture for good um, is to build our students' interest. So if you know, our, the teacher or the speaker is really passionate about a topic that's relatively new to our student audience, then a lecture can be a really great way to spark our students' interest and motivate our students. Um, so kind of think about, for reference, a good keynote or an, a good in introductory presentation that you've seen at a conference and, you know, what was engaging about that? Why was hearing this person speak so exciting or so interesting to you? And then how can we kind of translate that into our own lectures? Um, so what is a lecture not so good for, on the other hand? Um, a lecture by itself is not so great at fostering active learning. Um, active learning gives students the opportunity to engage with and respond to the course material. So with active learning, the emphasis is on developing students' skills rather than just on information trans transfer. Um, but active learning techniques can be added to traditional lectures um, since, you know, lectures typically don't stimulate active learning. They don't really help with the traits of active learning, um, which are to stimulate higher order thinking, um, engaging learners, developing learner skills and exploring students attitudes or values. So we can use active learning, you know, in conjunction with lecture in order to do those those things. So active learning doesn't need to be thrown out. We don't need to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but we do need to marry it with active learning. Um, so what are some strategies for engaging students? Um, and if you have any, any strategies for engaging students that you wanna share in the chat, you can do so there. I'll give a minute just in case there are some, in the, this could be for, you know, even smaller classes, how do you engage your students just generally? What are some strategies that you use? Great, yeah, small group work, discussion, short written responses, all things that can work in either small or large classes. You might just need to, to do a little bit of tweaking for large classes. All right, so one thing that we can do for large classes is rethink our group work. Um, so one, one piece, and this works for, for any group work for small or large classes, but giving some students choice um, for group work is a good strategy. So allowing students, for example, to sign up for group projects by selecting a topic or an assignment, um, a random assignment or an instructor assignment. Um, and then pairing them up in that way. So they're signing up for, for the topic rather than signing, you know, grouping together with, with students right off the bat. Um, and then give them a project where each person needs to present or contribute. So really um, think thoughtfully about that group work and how each person is going to contribute or how each person is going to kind of be pushed to contribute um within that group so presentations uh, discussion board leaders they could do virtual presentations online um they could build a study unit for a large assessment you know the kind of world is your oyster there what what what's going to be the most um, meaningful way for you to check for student understanding and for your students to demonstrate their learning 
um, within the group. Also, something that I do is making um, peer grading or peer reviews part of their final score for the group work. Um, I use a rubric with my students. I have them, you know, grade their group members on their engagement in the group and their work in the group. Um, and to give me some written explanations of that as well. So why did you give, you know, your group member the score for this criteria, criterion? Um, and then I look at those, I read through them, um, and students, because they know they're going to be assessed in that way, they tend to be more engaged with the group. Um, and students, you know, I tell them that their, their classmates aren't gonna see these. Um, so, you know, they can feel comfortable being honest because if they think that their their peer is going to see that um, that grade, then that might be um, a deterrent to being honest because they're afraid of hurting people's feelings. So what I'll do then is you know kind of summarize feedback um, for the students so that they can identify who gave them what feedback in the, the small group, um, but that they still get that feedback for the next you know group assignment so that they can improve their performance and their participation. Also, think about how you want your students to meet and how they're likely to meet. Um, so they could meet, you know, during class, maybe if we've got um, an hour and 15 minute class, maybe you have class for the first hour and then save the, the last 15 minutes or start the class the first 15 minutes with their individual groups, um, have them meet with you individually in groups um, to talk about updates, um, ask questions, get answers, talk about their agenda, their plans for completing the project um, or the presentation. Um, so you can do this either in class or you can have sort of mandatory office hours for the group or for individual group members to um, to kind of relay the information to you if they can't all meet um, at the same time for the group project. So, you know, what's going to be the best way for you to hold them accountable for, for their group work, basically? <clears throat> and make sure that each group member is getting something out of it. Um, all right, so another strategy is uh, just in time teaching. And um, so, Vanderbilt Center for Teaching has a whole article on just-in-time teaching, um, and I'll give you a little bit of an overview of that, but basically it's a, a teaching learning strategy that promotes the use of class time for active learning, which is, you know, kind of what we're talking about. Um, so, so it's got, got this feedback loop between web-based or it, online learning materials and the classroom where they're going to be interactive. Um, so students are going to prepare for their class. They're going to read from the textbook or watch your, your lecture recordings, um, your, your brief lecture recordings in their, their Blackboard course or their online learning management system course. Um, use other resources posted online and then complete assignments, which they call either warm-ups or puzzles. Um, so something that they have to actually do with what they've read so that you can gauge their understanding um before class so the assignments should have some sort of a complex answer um, students are working outside of class to prepare for um, the work in class the active learning in class as well students answers you know to those pre-class activities or assessments are given to the instructor before class starts ideally a few hours a day before class starts um, and that allows us to, to read through them to, or, you know, for large classes to skim through them to make sure um, that students are understanding concepts, where are the, the pain points, um, where do we need to maybe adapt our lesson as needed. Um, and it also allows us to create an interactive classroom environment that's emphasizing active learning, cooperative problem solving, um, rather than just you know, sitting there and listening to us talk the entire time. Um, so the strategy works well for large classes because it allows us to devote more class time to active learning in small groups. To start using this strategy, you could, you could begin with a pre-class required submission 
and then based on those student responses, you know, obviously that's something to keep in mind that if you, you do this, it's going to create a little bit more work for you because you're going to have to, well, a lot more work for you. Let's be honest. It's a large class. So based on, you know, the required submissions, what we need to do is we need to do something with that for it to be meaningful and for us to provide that just in time teaching. So we need to read through or skim through those responses. Um, and based on that, we can determine which group our students will be in for the active learning exercise in class. So maybe we group students based on, um, you know, this student doesn't really get this concept, this student really, really gets it. So maybe we pair those students together for the activity or you know, this group of students didn't really get this concept. I'm going to have them do something active on this concept so that they get it in class. I'm going to put them together to do that. So however you want to do that or whatever makes sense for you to be able to support their their support their learning um, and provide that just in time teaching. Um, so, for example, each group might be asked to solve a problem and present it to the class. Um, you can assign groups whatever active learning task makes sense for the concepts that students are learning so that they can apply what they learned before class and, and what they demonstrated in their learning in those pre-class assessments. And then you can adapt your lesson and your um, active learning projects or activities based on those your students' demonstration of their comprehension and the application of those learning concepts. Um, another strategy is equity cards. Um, so students' perceptions of, um, of the instructor can be challenging to deal with, given you know, that in large classes, it's more difficult to have meaningful one-on-one -on -one ex exchanges with each and every one of our students. But there's a lot we can do to project that kind of disposition to promote student participation and promote those senses of connections between ourselves and our students, because that is an important part of student learning and persistence is that they feel connected, that they feel, um, you know, a sense of class community. So one important uh, teaching practice for large classes is to make it a priority to learn and use student names, obviously much easier in a smaller class setting, um, but it can be difficult to do with large class it's still important to creating that sense of connection and belonging for students though. Um, so one strategy that you could use is the equity cards. Um, so we can generate these at NIU. Um, you can download your class roster with students pictures um, from their, their NIU one cards, their student ID cards um, on our My NIU system. And you can create equity cards, um, you know, for each student that has their picture on it so you can kind of identify them in class, call on them, look at them when you're calling on them, um, and use those, those cards to call in people at random from the card pile. Um, that's ensuring that we're using our students' names. It helps ensure a broad base of participation too because we can then kind of put that student in a new pile. Okay, we've already called on these, this student. Um, let's see who else I can call on. Um, and if you want to you know, vary who you call on across class sessions too. You can kind of keep those students set aside so that you can make sure that you've called on each student at least once throughout the semester or throughout however, you know, long would make sense for that depending on the size of your class because large classes can be, you know, 50 students, it can be 200 students. So um, it might be more feasible to call on each of 50 students throughout the semester versus each of 200 students. Um, so it can, you know, ensure that broad base of participation. It can make students less likely to, to disengage during class if they know that, the, you know, there's a chance that they might be called on. Um, and it can be a helpful tool in learning our students' names, too. Um, and another strategy that you could do is, is to have students create that ID card at the beginning of the course. So instead of you doing that, um, you know, hand out, um, you know, note cards or whatever at the beginning of the course the first day, have them write down their names and their pronouns if they choose to uh, share those with you, maybe something about themselves. So you can kind of get to know your students, too, and then use those as your equity cards. Um, so this will help definitely, um, this is more, definitely more of a face-to-face uh, -face class strategy, um, 
but you know something similar in an online class might be if you have a discussion board um, where you want students to contribute, making sure that you respond to you know, each student, um, not every single week, particularly if you have 50, 100 students that just take forever, but you know, keep, keep a checklist, keep the roster there and make sure that you've you know, given an individualized response to each student at least once you know, throughout that semester so that they get that sense of belonging. Um, another strategy is cliffhanger lecturing. Um, so this is where, you know, instead of making each of our topics, each of our course concepts fit neatly within the, that day's class period, we intentionally structure topics with cliffhangers. So, you know, the, our topic ends at, you know, three quarters of the way through that topic. Um, in the class period. And then we leave a quarter of that time to start the next module or topic in the next class session. So that ge generates this kind of um, anticipation for students, um, inter helps us interconnect topics a little bit better. Um, and then it creates a sort of bridge between sessions so that students know how our class sessions are connected to one another. <clears throat> Um, another strategy is pass the pointer. Um, and this is, you know, we're, we're going to put a, a complex and intricate or a detailed image on the screen, um, you know, obviously based on a course concept and asking for, for volunteers to, you know, borrow the laser pointer um, to identify some key features of that image or to ask questions about things in the image that they don't understand. Um, so this, this allows students some choice. They can show their knowledge. Um, it gets students, you know, up and moving around a little bit, um, and it allows for clarifying some complex, complex aspects of the topic. So not just expecting students to provide answers, but also encouraging them to ask questions uh, about things that they don't understand. Um, so next we'll talk a little bit about planning for active learning. Um, along with um, some steps for getting started and then an example example le lecture plan. So here are 10 steps to getting started with active learning. Um, preparing for active learning is important to ensure successful interactions in our class. So we don't just want to kind of throw it at students. We want to prepare them to be active learners. Um, so we want to start by building an open and safe climate in the classroom. We want to provide um, chances for our students to connect with each other and with us. Um, so this welcoming, this safe environment where students feel safe making mistakes or asking questions. Um, and that'll encourage students to engage and it's also going to promote their deeper learning. We also always want to have a goal for our activities that we use in our class. Um, so we want to select first the correct activity for what we want students to get out of that session. Um, so when we're deciding on the type of activity that we want to use, um, we want to consider the student population. We want to consider our time constraints. We want to think about whether we're going to use small groups or pairs. Uh, we want to think about the size of the class, the classroom environment. Um, so do the chairs move? Do they not move? Um, you know, how will logistics challenge us um, in the classroom and how can we overcome those challenges and work around them? Um, and then select an activity that is likely to be successful given the specific situation for each of our class sessions. Um, we also want to prepare for our session. We want to have, you know, if we have handouts, make sure that we have enough handouts. If we're going to be using tech, we want to make sure that we know how to use the tech, that it's working. Um, and if it's not working, what do we do? Is there a backup plan? Um, what information do we need to build into our uh, learning management system course um, to help students prepare for the class session and active learning? Um, do we need to link to other class elements to help build a connection among our course materials? Um, so we want to make sure that we, we do the prep work and we prep our students well. We also want to develop an introduction for the activity and a plan for our logistics. So how are we going to, how do we tell that if the activity was successful? 
we need to think about what we want to learn from this ourselves as faculty. Um, and how are we going to tell if that has happened, if that has occurred? Um, and then we do it. We do the activity. We take a chance. We conduct that activity. Maybe it'll work out. Maybe it won't. Um, and maybe it works out one semester and maybe the next semester is a complete flop with a whole new set of students and we need to, you know, pivot. Um, so we want to take notes. What went well? What could be revised for maybe a smoother process next time? Um, and then we keep going. We, we do it again with another class. We expand based on the insights that we gained during that first, second, third iteration. And we continue to improve and to grow and to adjust for each um, student population. All right, so here's a, just a sample lecture plan for, an act, for active learning from a faculty member um, out of a faculty focus article. And the faculty member in this article explained that they distribute worksheets with an exercise or a question that students need to solve in less than five minutes. So it's just very brief. Um, they let the students first think about the problem independently, and then they're prompted to discuss it with their neighbor, with a partner. Um, and at the same time, teaching assistants and the faculty member walk around to help and encourage students. Um, that's another important piece is, is our teaching assistants. Um, so if we have a large class, chances are, depending on the size of the class and, and your program, you probably are going to have a teaching assistant or maybe multiple teaching assistants to help you out with that. So utilize them. Um, utilize them to help you engage your students, to help create those connections and create that sense of belonging with your students. Um, so, you know, when students are discussing with their neighbor, we're walking around, our teaching assistants are walking around, helping them, encouraging them. Um, and then we want to explain, um, or sorry, the faculty member in the article explains that most of their, typically when, when they do this activity, most students are on task during the exercise, which is encouraging. Um, but there's always, there's always that few that don't want to participate, right? Um, but that walking around helps identify those students. Um, maybe we encourage them, maybe we prod them to do the active learning exercise. And it also gives us an other important information about how many of our students are actively participating in that important problem solving task because active learning leads to improved comprehension of our course concepts. So if they're not doing the active learning, then they're not getting that benefit out of it. Um, and it's not serving its purpose. In large classes, um, there isn't a ch always a chance to talk to every single group, um, particularly if it's going to be, you know, a brief exercise. Um, but there are other ways to get student feedback on the exercise if you're not able to walk around. If you know, for example, the logistics of the classroom, you just can't can't walk around every group because you just can't. Um, or the class is so large or you get caught up with one group of students who have a question that you need to help them with. Um, and there's other, but there's other ways to get student feedback on the exercise from the whole class, the class as a whole, um, and to get feedback on student engagement and their learning. And one suggestion is to poll students to get insight into how they, or survey students to get insight into how they spent their time in class. Um, so to make that poll useful for us and to accurately represent student engagement and learning, it needs to be completely anonymous. Um, and we can do this either with, with in-class um, polling, a handout, you know, so we give them, um, you know, just a, a note card that has the question on it and they can circle their, their response and turn that into you um, with, without their name on it. Um, or we could do eye clickers, do this in class at the end of the class period. Um, and, and pull our students, or we can have it as something that they do outside of class or um, do within our learning management system, or um, at NIU, we've got Qualtrics, or we have um, Microsoft Forms. So you can pull them in any way that makes sense, um, just logistically and for time. Um, but an example poll question with multiple choice responses that the faculty member in the article gives is um, when you were given a question to solve in class and asked to discuss the question with your neighbor, you mostly, and then the options that the student can choose from are A, discuss the question with more than four, four students, um, 
B, discuss the question in a group of two to three students. C, try to solve the question by yourself. D, read your notes. E, listened to others discussing the question or F, none of the above. So obviously if there's a lot of Fs in there, then we want to figure out a way to engage those students who just completely disengaged um, from the activity so that they can benefit from it. All right, so now I'm going to move into Q&A if you have any questions um, or if you have any thoughts on any of the strategies that we've gone over today and how they might, for example, translate um, to an online class, um, a large online class or any strategies that you have um, that, you know, popped into your head as we were going through these examples, um, please feel free to share those and I'll give you a minute to, to think and um, it, or if you have any questions um, to post your questions or to unmute yourself as well and ask those questions or share those Thanks, Scott. Yeah, and if you think of anything afterward, um, any questions that come up, um, just let me know. And for both of you who are here um, live today, I will send you a follow-up email this afternoon with some links to resources too. Um, and I will particularly find some resources for large online classes for you too um, and, and share those as well so that you have um, additional strategies uh, on top of the ones that I discussed today. Yeah, no problem. Um, so if you want to connect with any of us in, in CIDL at NIU, um, we have our CIDL help um, and we offer online phone and web conferencing. That's at niu.edu slash CIDL slash help. Um, we also have our upcoming programs listed through May. We are in the process of adding our June and July programs as well um, to our niu.edu slash CIDL slash programs. And then you can just um, explore all of the resources that we have on our website too, just at niu.edu slash CIDL. Um, and thank you so much for coming to this workshop today. And if you have any questions um, after the fact, just let me know um, or have any specific requests for resources, I can definitely work on those as well. So have a great rest of your day. And um, I hope you have a great experience with active learning in your large classes.